A few years ago, a remarkable thing happened during the Rose Bowl parade on New Year's Day. With tens of thousands of people lining the parade route and millions more watching TV of maybe the largest parade in the United States, there was a long delay because one of the large floats near the beginning of the parade slowly lost power and came to a complete stop. And the beautiful float was so large that it covered most of the street and the other floats and the marching bands didn't have the room to go around it. So the parade just had to stop dead still for some time. And a quick mechanical investigation revealed that the problem was not some major mechanical failure. In fact, the problem was quite simple. They had run out of gas. The float had run out of gas. Somebody had to go and find a few gallons of gas and bring it back and put it in the float so that the Tournament of Roses parade could start again. But then there's the rest of that story, which is most ironic, for you see the float that ran out of glass that day was being sponsored by one of the largest and best known oil and gas companies in the whole world, the Standard Oil Company. How embarrassing. The Standard Oil Company had run out of gas in the largest parade in the world. (laughs) I imagine there were some interesting words that were spoken in the board meeting of Standard Oil later. And as I was reading that story and thinking about it, I thought back to when my mother passed away a few years ago. My brother and I, uh, we stayed at, Diane and I stayed at my brother's house in Tennessee while we were, uh, while we were getting ready for the funeral. And we had several, as all families do, conversations about the past and growing up and all. And uh, it, uh, I was reminding him of when I ran out of gas when I was about 16 or 17 years old. The first time and the only time I have ever also run out of gas. And I called my brother who's six and a half years older than me and he had to leave work and come and bring me gas. And he was not happy at all. And my brother was a big guy. He was over 300 pounds. And he, uh, he, you know, he makes his living being a pirate. So um, that'll tell you a little something. And uh, when he brought me the gas, I'll never forget what he said to me and how he said it to me. He said, all right, look, I've bailed you out this one time, but there is no excuse for anybody ever to run out of gas. If you ever call me again, because you have run out of gas. He said, there are gas stations on every corner. If you ever call me again because you have run out of gas, I am personally going to come and kick your, well, it's an anatomical term referring to the backside of the body. Most of us have run out of gas at some time or another. If we're not paying attention we can easily run out of gas. And so that's why it's important that we keep an eye on our gas tank and that we fill up our gas tank in our car. And so since that day with my brother, my my wife and my kids will tell you, when my gas tank gets down to about a quarter full, I always stop and fill it up all the way to the top. It's awfully easy to run out of gas. It's awfully easy to run out of gas spiritually too. And that's precisely what the Apostle Paul was talking about to the church at Philippi in our text this morning. Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. A lot of scholars believe that he was executed by the Romans just shortly after he wrote this letter. And he probably saw the handwriting on the wall. He probably saw what was coming. So he wrote to his good friends in the Philippian church to affirm them, to assure them, to encourage them, to give them his last words of affection and instruction and encouragement to hang in there, to hold on to their faith, to not run out of gas, to make sure they keep their spiritual tank full. 
So in some of the last words the Apostle Paul ever wrote, we read, I don't mean to say that I have already attained these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Jesus Christ is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on all these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it clear to you but we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Look at that last verse again. We must hold on to the progress we have already made. We must keep our spiritual tank full. Now let me say something to you church with all the feeling that I have in my heart. And it's the same thing that the Apostle Paul is saying to the Philippian church. Please don't give up. Please don't quit. Please don't quit on life. Don't quit on your faith. Don't quit on your church. Most importantly, don't quit on God. Don't run out of spiritual gas. Keep your spiritual tank full. How do you do that? Well, you keep your spiritual tank full by trusting in God completely. That's what Paul said at the beginning of our text to the church at Philippi. I press on toward whatever future lies ahead, knowing God is there for me. That is wholehearted, unflinching trust in God. And keep in mind, he's writing this while he knows he's about to be executed. He knows he's about to die for his faith. And he says, I press on trusting God to be there for me. What does it mean to you to trust in God? The great author Henry Nguyen, just before he died, wrote his last book called Sabbatical Journeys. And in it, he talks about a well-known trapeze family, the Flying Rodleys. And it talks about how their act, their performance, their livelihood, their survival is absolutely dependent on trust in one another. And I never thought about this before, but if you've ever watched uh, those kinds of performances, how true that is. Their life, their livelihood, everything is dependent on them being precise and exact and trusting one another. I mean, just think of it, the special and unique relationship that exists between the flyer and the catcher in trapeze acts. The flyer lets go of his swing, swinging through the air toward the catcher on the other swing, releasing at just the right moment and flying in an arc toward the catcher trusting him or her completely. It's an act of total, absolute, complete trust. In the Christian faith, we are the flyer. God is the catcher, which means that we do our best and we trust God for the rest. We fly toward God and toward the future and trust God to be there for us, to catch us and to save us. I know many of you probably saw the movie Cast Away with Tom Hanks and there's an old story about a man who was uh, marooned on a deserted island like Tom Hanks in that movie. And he prayed fervently for God to rescue him. And every day he scanned the horizon for help, but no help was to come. So he eventually started to settle in as you would do. He managed to build a little small hut out of driftwood to protect him from the elements and to protect his possessions. 
One day the man went out for food and when he returned, he found his little hut was going up in flames, blazing away. And the smoke was flying up in the sky. The worst had happened. Once again, he had lost everything. And he was heartbroken. And he looked up into the heavens and he said, God, why, why, why? How could you possibly do this to me? He went to sleep despondent that night and early the next morning, he was awakened by the sound of a ship that was approaching the island. It had come to rescue him. He said, how on earth did you find me? How on earth after all this time did you know I was here? And the rescuer said, we saw your smoke signal. It's awfully easy to get discouraged when things are going bad. It's been awfully easy for many people these last few weeks to get discouraged, downhearted, and lonely. So let me tell you from the words of the Apostle Paul here to the church at Philippi, we need not lose heart because God is behind this. God is at work in our lives, even in the midst of any pain and suffering and disappointment. And even the Bible says at the point of death, we can trust God to be there for us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We're the flyers. We're flying through life, trusting God to catch us, to keep your spiritual tank full, my friends. Keep on trusting God wholeheartedly. And to keep your spiritual tank full, secondly, Practice the spiritual disciplines regularly. Through this pandemic, Sean McAfee, our family minister, has done an outstanding job of giving us the chance to practice the spiritual disciplines daily. We've been having a daily prayer session on Facebook Live every night at 7 o'clock. There have been Sunday school classes still available to you every Sunday and on Wednesday night. Still opportunities to attend church together. There are still opportunities to study the Bible conscientiously. We're still doing our New Testament Bible reading that we began on January 1st, and I've added to that a daily Facebook devotional for that day's chapter every day. These are the things that feed our souls. These are the things that heal our souls. Continue in the spiritual disciplines, especially during this time period. A few years ago, uh, a man wrote a letter to the editor of a newspaper and bluntly complained that it did him absolutely no good to go to church every Sunday. His letter said, I have gone to church for 30 years now, and in that time I figure I have heard somewhere around 3,000 sermons, and for the life of me, I can't remember a single one of them. So I think I'm wasting my time and the preachers are wasting their time by giving the sermons too. Well, as you might imagine, that letter started a real controversy in the letters to the editor column with people responding to it. And letters came pouring in day after day and that went on for several weeks until one man's letter sort of ended the discussion for everybody. This man wrote in, I've been married for 30 years now. In that time, my wife, as best I can estimate, has cooked about 32,000 meals. For the life of me, I cannot recall the entire menu of a single one of those meals. However, I do know this. They all nourished me and gave me the strength I needed to do my work. And if my wife had not cooked those meals, I would not physically be here today. I would be dead. Likewise. If I had not gone to church for nourishment, I would be spiritually dead today. You see, we are spiritually fed by the disciplines and habits. And discipline and habit mean exactly what they say. Going to church is a habit. So is not going to church. Praying is a habit. 
and not praying is a habit. Giving to God is a habit, both of money and of time and talent, and not giving to God in any of those ways is also a habit. Studying the scriptures is a habit. Once you start a New Testament reading plan or a one-year Bible plan, it becomes a part of your day, a habit. And not ever picking up the Bible is a habit too. And these spiritual disciplines are important habits to cultivate us in our life because whether we realize it at the time or not, they are feeding us spiritually. They are making us strong spiritually, enabling us to grow and mature spiritually. They are literally keeping us alive spiritually, just like our food keeps us alive physically. Don't run out of gas. Don't run out of gas. If you want to keep your spiritual tank full, practice the spiritual disciplines regularly. And finally this morning, my friends, you keep your spiritual tank full by loving and serving other people sacrificially. Jesus told us this so beautifully in John chapter 13 as a part of that discourse right before he went to Calvary. He said to his disciples, so I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. And your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Have you heard the old story about a duke and a duchess who went on a stroll? Try to picture, if you will, uh, Downton Abbey and... Uh, those beautiful English grounds. And uh, the Duke and Duchess went out for a stroll one morning as they walked hand in hand through their lavish country estate. They noticed a man standing in a stately uniform in their beautiful garden. And the Duchess said, who is that man? He always stands there. I have no idea who he is. He's been standing there for years and I don't know who he is. And the Duke said, you know, I don't either. I too have seen him standing there many times over the years, but I have no idea who he is or what he does. And the Duchess said, well, I'm going to find out. And she walked over to the servant and she said, please tell me, who are you? Do you work here? Are you a part of our staff? And he said, oh yes, my lady. I have been your faithful servant now for almost 30 years. And she said, 30 years? Oh my. And what is your specific job? He said, I was hired 30 years ago to take care of your dog. And the Duchess said, wait a minute. My dog died 27 years ago. To which the servant replied, yes, my lady, that is correct. And what, my lady, would you like for me to do for you now? <laughs> Strange as that may seem, that old story with its punchline question. And what would you like for me to do for you now? Gently reminds me of the attitude of a lot of people today. God saved them 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And all that time they've just been sort of standing around. See, God did not save you to sit. The Bible says God saved you to serve. You are his workmanship to do good deeds created in Christ Jesus. God didn't love you just so you could hoard all his love for yourself. He loved you so that you could share the great love of God by serving other people. And then Jesus, our Lord himself said, if you love me, obey my commandments. One way that you ensure you don't run out of gas and that you keep your own spiritual tank full is by helping to fill other people's spiritual tanks. By sacrificially loving and serving other people. 
Paul said in Galatians 5.13, you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. How do you keep your faith alive? How do you keep from running out of gas? Well, you keep on trusting God to fill your spiritual tank. You keep on practicing the spiritual disciplines to keep yourself fed spiritually and full. And you continue to love and serve other people sacrificially. And when you do that, you will notice your spiritual tank stays on the F side all the time instead of the E side. And you won't have to worry about running out of gas or my brother coming to visit you. May God bless you.